Hi, and welcome to this video running through um, the AS Biology breadth paper that you did for your end of year 12 assessment. Um, now, before we get started, I just want to say a massive well done to everyone. Uh, I thought the results were really, really encouraging. Um, and even if you got a result that you weren't so happy with, um, I think that you all showed good understanding. Um, it's just exam technique that may have been lacking um, and using the key vocabulary that you need to use. This mark scheme, as it's a practice paper, is quite picky. So they really, really need you to use the correct language to get the marks. Even if you kind of understood it, you might, not, you might have missed out because of that. So we're going to get straight into it. Here's the multiple choice mark scheme. So first what you need to do is just uh, have a look at your paper, see where you went wrong, what the correct answer was. If you kind of understand, okay, see, I see I made a mistake there, then that's great. And if not, I'm now going to do a little run through section for the multiple choice. Uh, and you can skip to the right points of that uh, of the next 10 minutes or so to look at each individual question that you got wrong. Um, and if you didn't get many wrong, you can uh, just watch those little bits and move on to the longer answer uh, questions, which I'm going to look at after that. OK, so pause the video now, double check which ones you got right, which you got wrong, and then we'll get started uh, doing the run through of this bit. OK, here we go. All right. Okay, so which inorganic ion acts as a cofactor for amylase? That one you just need to know. It's just the knowledge thing. Its uh, answer is C. Translocation occurs uh, through sibtium elements by, this is mass flow. I'm just going to kind of work it out here. So that means we can cross off this one. Sucrose is loaded into the phloem at regions of the plant known as sources. So loaded at a source, so we can cross out this one here as well. So we've crossed out C, we've crossed out A. This mechanism is active. The addition of sucrose uh, that l lowers the water potential of the sieve element sap. This causes water to enter from surrounding tissues by osmosis which in turn increases the water potential, oh, well, pressure, yeah, pressure of the sap. So uh, if we put all that in, we end up with D. D is the answer that we need. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> Three, here's an enzyme, here's the substrate, um, and then we've got three molecules, P, Q, and R. Each substance could either bind to the enzyme or to the substrate to cause an effect. So which option describes um, the most likely effect on the rate of reaction in each tube compared with the control? All right, so tube P, uh, if that can fit, that looks pretty similar to the shape of the substrate. So tube P is going to be decreased because that tube P is acting as a uh, sorry, P would be acting as a competitive inhibitor. Sorry, that competitive inhibitor. Uh, now, tube Q, this is a weird one because this one basically could fit with the substrate. The substrate could fit in there. So what that would essentially do is Q is acting like as a, a sponge for the substrate. It's not technically inhibitor, but it kind of mops up the substrate, which means that there'd be a, a effectively lower concentration of the substrate. So therefore, we would expect a decrease in rate. So it's that one. And then R doesn't really fit anything, so that would be no effect. So the answer is D. Bit of a weird one there, because this is not a competitive inhibitor, but it binds to the substrate, which would then mean the substrate could not get into the enzyme. So it's a bit of a strange concept. Four. <clears throat> After being mixed with iodine, which of the following would show a blue-black colour? So remember, this is the test for starch blue-black, uh, and it's definitely going to be uh, A, because potato tuber cells, that's a store of starch. Erythrocytes, red blood cells, no. Not going to be any starch in a red blood cell, because there isn't starch in mammals. Sieve tube elements, not really, because we're talking about the transport of sucrose through those. It is a plant tissue, but not so likely. Neutrophils, again, that's a uh, animal white blood cell, so that's not going to be it. So it's A. <clears throat> Five. Okay, here's a conjugated protein that is a respiratory pigment in muscle cells. Which part of the, this is? This is basically, if you recognize this, uh, it's, 
I'm not sure if it's it's very similar to heme and hemoglobin. It's a, it's a porphyrin ring. It, it, it's a so it, it's a heme derivative. If this could actually be a, this is probably it's a respiratory pigment. It's most likely a cytochrome, but actually the this kind of group is quite similar to the heme group and hemoglobin as well. Um, so this whole thing is a prosthetic group. Okay, not a disulfide bond. That's between two cysteine amino acids. This is, this is not the quaternary structure. The quaternary structure is the whole protein plus the prosthetic group. It's the whole thing. So it's not that, and it's not the polypeptide because it's not protein, it's A, it's the prosthetic group. Moving on. Okay, six, this is the sort of measles and style type experiment. So we've got the 15N, um, and it was then incubated with the 14N. So the, the DNA with 15N is, is kind of at the start, and then the new DNA that is added in is the 14N. So after one DNA, after one round of replication, it's semi-conservative. So this hopefully was something that you just recognized. This is the semi-conservative one here, because we've got one heavy strand that was the original strand, and then we have the newer strand that has been synthesized on it, using it as a template. So the answer to six is A. Moving on. Okay, so question seven. This question is about um, oncotic versus hydrostatic pressure at different ends of the capillary. So over here, I kind of drawn a basic diagram. Here's an, uh, the arterial end of the capillary. Here's the venous end, and this is the kind of the cells which are going to be bathed in the tissue fluid. So the first thing to consider is the hydrostatic pressure, which I'll draw in blue. So the hydrostatic pressure at the beginning is large. Um, but the pressure falls across the vein. So the hydrostatic pressure at the end is a lot smaller. Um, the second thing to consider is the oncotic pressure. So the oncotic pressure doesn't actually change. That's the pressure from the kind of um, the, 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 the solutes in the, uh, in the capillary. And it's sort of pulling in. So the oncotic pressure here is kind of like that. A bit smaller than the uh, hydrostatic pressure, which means that tissue fluid is created over here. But then by the end, the... With the hydrostatic pressure having fallen, the oncotic pressure is larger, which causes tissue fluid to be drawn back into capillary at the venous end. So what corresponds with that here? At the arterial end, so we're looking for a, a sort of a minus 20 here because it's a pressure pulling in, hydrostatic pressure. It's got to be big and it's got to be um, it's got positive and it's got to be larger than the oncotic pressure. So we could well, they're talking about that one, really. That's the only one. This this one wouldn't work because this is not negative. So really, in fact, it's D already. But let's just double check at the venous end. Oncotic pressure doesn't change, but the hydrostatic pressure has dropped. So yeah, the answer for seven is going to be D. Okay. Ah, oh, this is a this was a really tricky one. It's mean. I'll tell you why it's mean. So this here, the reason this question is mean is because this says this is the volume of air in the spirometer DM cubed. That's in the spirometer, not in the lungs, okay? So that means that if the um, air in the spirometer is getting larger, that means that the person has exhaled into the spirometer. So this is exhalation. And if the volume of air in the spirometer is decreasing, that means people are drawing air into their lungs. So this is inhalation. So therefore, which option correctly describes what is happening at point Z? So during point Z, the person is exhaling. So which one is to do with exhaling? It's not pressure inside the lungs is low. It's going to be slightly higher. <sighs> Volume of thorax is not large. It's fairly small at this point because it's almost approaching the maximal exhale. The diaphragm is contracted, no, because that is contracting and pulling down as inhalation. So internal intercostal muscles are contracted. It's this one. The internal intercostal muscles pull the ribcage down and exhale the air. So the answer for that one is D. But it's all the tricky bit was all about recognizing this point. That was quite a mean question. Let's move on. Nine. Okay, show some of the checkpoints in the cell cycle. Now, if DNA damage is discovered at the G2 checkpoint, what happens? Uh, so that's right here, G2 checkpoint. So it's just before uh, mitosis, really. 
So what it, it really it's actually about what's the most sensible option for uh, the cell to do. So the cell cycle continues. No, we're not going to replicate DNA with, with damage. That could lead to cancer. So that's really that's not a good idea for a cell. The cell cycle is halted and the cell tries to repair the DNA. That is a good idea. The other ones, the cell cycle returns to G1 phase to try and correct the damage. Uh, no, it doesn't go, it would have to sort of skip. No, it would just, it doesn't return to G1 phase. That doesn't really make much sense. Now, this is an option, and many of you did put this. The cell cycle stops and the cell dies. So it's kind of an option, um, but in order to decide which is best, you kind of just have to think what's more sensible for the cell. Um, if the cell can repair its DNA, that's better option than the cell dying. So B is a more sensible option for the cell, and that is in fact what it does. It will try to repair the DNA. If it's really, really bad damage that can't be repaired, then it might go through apoptosis and die. Okay, 10. Which of the following is not a role of an intracellular membrane? Now, you've really got to spot that, don't you? Intracellular, okay? Inside the cell, okay? Not the outside, inside. So, cell-to-cell -cell signaling, which is not, right, is that one. Because cell-to-cell -cell signaling is to do with external membranes. So it's not the inside. Partially permeable barrier, yes, that, for example, a barrier between the mitochondria and the cytoplasm, site of chemical reactions, yes, for example, protein synthesis, the endoplasmic reticulum, also the mitochondria, transport of substances across the membrane, yes, that happens, again, across the mitochondrial membrane. So the answer is A, and it's all about spotting this. 11. The mitotic cell cycle is divided into a number of stages. In which of the following stages will the chromosomes line up down the equator of the cell? This one is just quite simple, a fact one is metaphase. So metaphase, they, they line up, and then at anaphase, they get pulled apart. Telophase, they kind of reach the poles. 12. Which of the following factors does not affect the shape of the active site of an enzyme? Does not affect the shape of the active site of an enzyme. So a drop in temperature. That, hmm, I don't think that will, but I'm just going to go through and double check. Non-competitive inhibitor. Well, that will, because the non-competitive inhibitor binds somewhere else and it disturbs the 3D shape of the enzyme affecting the active site. So it's definitely not, definitely not that one. That will affect the shape. That will affect the shape. Change in pH will affect the shape. Binding of substrate can affect the shape if it's the induced fit. So let's just say yes. I, I induced fit model. Drop in temperature. So that, yeah, that's the clear winner. It doesn't affect the shape. It just affects whether the substrate kind of gets into the active site quickly enough because um, there's low kinetic energy of the particles, so 12a. 13. Which of the following statements is a step in meiosis that can lead to variation with the species? Hmm. Step in meiosis. Hmm. Now, I would say not 13a, because that, even though that can lead to variation, but is it really happening in meiosis? DNA replication, remember, occurs in S phase, which is not meiosis, because meiosis is the cell division phase, so it's not A. Random fusion of gametes, does that happen in meiosis? No, that's fertilization, so again, that's not correct. Independent assortment of homologous chromosomes, yes. This one, double check the last one. Chromosomes forming homologous pairs called bivalents. Well, the formation of the bivalents is not, is not the issue. It's the assortment of the homologous chromosomes once the, that bivalent is separated. That is the key thing. So 13 is C. 14. Oh, I remember this one. This is a bit of a tricky one. Uh, okay, so tested a range of known concentrations of reducing sugar using Benedict solution colorimetry. And there's the calibration curve. So now we need to look at these things and put them in order. I think the best way to do this was to actually do it on the graph. So P has an absorption of 60%. So 60% is there. So therefore P is there. Okay. So if we so go from 60%, what I've done there is gone across to there, to P, and then I've gone down to there. So P is there. What about Q? Q is at 40. So 40. I'm going across and down. So Q is here. Uh, R is at 70. So 70 is up there. So R is about there. And S is 100, so well, that's right over here. So 
uh, select the option that gives the correct se sequence of reducing su sugar concentrations from highest to lowest. So it goes QPRS, which is D. QPRS. On to 15. Enzymes are capable uh, of affecting the metabolism and structure of the whole organism. Which of the following enzymes will have the greatest effect on the development of an organism as a whole? So this is un highlighted, so worth just making sure that we really grasp that. The development of the organism. So things that influence cell specialization, cell differentiation, uh, and cell growth um, as well. So which one is the most important? Well, it's A. Um, now, this is sort of touched on in the syllabus. It's not fully explained. So this, this is a bit going a bit beyond the, the core syllabus. A methyl transferase adds methyl groups to DNA, allowing genes to be switched on or off. So basically, along the backbone of the DNA, let me just draw a bit of a DNA. Oops, double helix like this. Along the backbone, we can add these little methyl groups, so like CH3, like this. And if these methyl groups are added in certain spots, it kind of silences the DNA. It causes the DNA to coil up very tightly and not really be read by the machinery of the cell, like the transcription machinery and translation machinery. So basically that turns off genes. Methylation turns off genes. So turning off genes is really related to cell specialization. For example, you have the same genes in your brain cells as your skin cells, but um, you have the same genes in the nucleus of the brain cell and skin cell, but different genes are switched on or switched off in those two different cells. So it is A. This one, reverse transcriptase, this is, to, this is nothing really to do with development of a cell. This is to do more with viruses. Deoxyribonuclease, digest free DNA molecules outside of the nucleus. That's more to do with, again, that's more to do with um, protecting against viruses that may have injected their DNA into the cell. Telomerase, this is this is more to do with, um, well, th this is kind of controversial. It's more to do with sort of stem cells and stuff, telomerase. Some people used to think that telomerase was like the fountain of youth, that if you could turn on telomerase, you'd kind of make all your cells young again. But I think that's kind of, that research has been slightly discredited, but some people still investigating it. So it's, the answer is A. Um, 16. 16 shows the results of an osmosis experiment on section of potato and beetroot. So first of all, let's just make sure we know which one's which. Potato, beetroot, I'm going to color code that because I find it easier to sort of look at color. So potato is this one. And let's do pink for beetroot because beetroot is pink. Okay, which option shows the correct percentage change in mass when a potato section was placed in solution with the highest water potential? So much things to kind of decode here. So highest water potential is going to be zero which is going to be pure water. That's the highest water potential. So potato, pure water potential, potatoes here. So we're talking about this one. Change in mass is 0 0.8 right there. Um, and we want that as a percentage change in mass. So it's 0 0.8. And the original mass of each potato section was 4.6 grams. Why are they making you work hard for this one, Mark, here? So 0 0.8 as a percentage of 4.6, so you do 0 0.8 divided by 4.6 times 100 to make a percent. And once you've done that, the answer will be D. This one. But of course, it is a positive change in mass, not a negative change in mass, so therefore we can immediately cross out these two words there. In fact, you don't even have to do a calculation. You can just do this... Um, kind of from estimation because you know it's you know it's going to be a positive change so therefore you can cross out the first one you can cross out the second one and 0 0.8 over 4.6 let's think of what kind of a percentage that would be that's going to be around about 20% because if it was 0 0.4 over 4.6 that's like a tenth so it's not going to be the one which is closer to a tenth it's going to be bigger than that so let's go d 17.4 okay moving on 17 a student observed mitosis in a prepared slide of a root tip. The student recorded a description for each of four cells A to D and said which stage of mitosis has been observed. 
which of the mitotic stage has been identified correctly? Oh, they've only identified one stage correctly. So let's look and see which one's which. Okay, spindle fibers clearly visible. Telophase, no, because the spindle fibers is pretty much gone by telophase because the chromosomes have reached the poles. Chromosomes aligned at the equator, anaphase, no, that would be metaphase. Sister chromatids pulled to poles of cell, no, because that's going to be an anaphase. Dark bodies visible with a nucleus prophase, yes, this is correct. So this is some very bad identifying from this student. They've only got one right. 18. The second division of meiosis. Second division. Remember, meiosis happens first one division, then a second. How is it different from mitosis? In the second division of meiosis, individual chromosomes do line up randomly on the equator, so it's not bad. Each chromosome replicates during metaphase. Oh, this is a bit of a not very nice language. It's um, That's not a difference. I mean, what they're talking about here is that the fact, I'm going to draw this for you, okay? So the fact that the chromosome starts out like this, okay? And then it, once it's split, it goes to that being pulled apart. So technically, that is a chromosome replicating because this is one chromosome and this is two. So technically, they both, they both do replicate. The DNA hasn't replicated, but technically, you can say that the chromosome has replicated. Um, chiasma formed between the chromatids of a bivalent. Um, that is not the case because that's happened in, in the first round of division. 18d, the separating chromatids of a pair are not necessarily the same. That's true because there may have been crossing over. So we may have got, you know, kind of stuff like this going on. We may have exchanged bits of material. So the answer is D. Okay, so tuberculosis is an infectious disease that affects humans. It's caused by a pathogen. So the pathogen that causes tuberculosis is a bacteria. Oops. And now we need to go through these and see which one is caused by a bacteria. Black cigacota, I believe, is a fungus. So it's not that one. Mosaic leaf discoloration is a virus. Ring rot in tomatoes is, I think, late Light is, it's not bacteria, I think it's, um, I think it might even be a protist. But it's C, the answer is C. You just have to remember these. Which of the following best describes the term biodiversity? Well, a variety of species is part of it. Number of individuals of each species? No, that's not biodiversity. C, the variety of genes? Yep, species, yep, and habitats. Yeah, that's a good one. It kind of encompasses everything. And this is just the variety of genes. So that's that would be genetic measure of biodiversity. But remember C, uh, biodiversity has three levels, genes, species, and habitats. So the answer is going to be C. Okay, so that's the multiple choice uh, section done. Now we're going to move on to the longer answers. Now remember when we're looking at the longer answers, it's all about keywords. Um, and it's also about saying enough points. For a three mark question, you want to say three things and try and say try and use three keywords. It's, it's sort of that simple, really, the strategy. Let's get going. <clears throat> okay, so on to the longer answer questions. Now, this one was a common mistake uh, amongst people. The structure Z here is the endothelium, okay? Endothelium, so not epithelium. Epithelium tends to be, generally, if you want a quick way of remembering it, epithelium tends to be the outer layer of something, and the endothelium quite often is the inner layer of something. So the endothelium is on the inside of a blood vessel. Okay, now this next one is quite mathsy. Um, now I can't actually measure on my screen here, but I'll take you through the process. Now the question asks you to calculate this area in here and this area in here and work them out as a ratio, right? Uh, sorry, not as a ratio, as a as a percention, percentage or proportion. So, and it says here, which lots of people missed, um, assume that the artery is circular and the vein is square in cross section. So the first step was to measure the radius here, or actually probably, sorry, the best way of doing that probably would be to work out the, sorry, the diameter and then divide by two. So measure the diameter, then divide by two, and then you do pi r squared to get the area. Here, you actually have to measure, well, 
you assume it is a, a square, so you basically measure the uh, the width across. Uh, so it's the W, and then you square it because it's the width times the width. It's roughly a square. Okay, so the width squared, um, and then you work out the uh, the ratio of those two. So then again, it says. Um, calculate the cross-sectional artery of the arteries lumen as a proportion of that of the vein. So you'll get the um, total area for the artery and you'll get the total area for the vein. So you then need to do um, artery divided by vein. Okay. Now let's look at the mark scheme for that. Here it is. So um, you will get eventually 0 0.15 plus or minus 0 0.05. So that means you could have had an answer of 0 0.10 to 0 0.20. That was the tolerance given. Now you could have got one mark for correctly calculating the, loom, the, the artery lumen divided by the vein lumen. You could have got one mark for either doing pi r squared or the, the width squared, the width times width, okay? So, uh, and also maximum two if you gave the answer to more than four significant figures. Now, I really said here, I don't like it when people are giving me answers in um, fractions because it basically makes it very difficult to mark. And pretty much, I don't think markers were going to give you a lot of time because they're going to require a lot of pressure. So they're not really going to um, take your fraction and make a decimal out of it and then check it. So please give your answers as decimals. Do not leave as fractions, do not give your answers as stuff like, I don't know, like all sorts of weird stuff like 2 pi over 7 and stuff. I don't know what that means. Uh, I can't visualize it. Please use decimals. Okay, let's get rid of that. Okay, onwards. Outline how the difference in lumen size between arteries and veins is related to their function. This question was quite tricky. So lumen size, so we're not talking about structure, and related to their function. So what we're not talking about for lumen size is we're not talking about the, the sort of the structure of the blood vessels, the, the, the sort of elastic fibers and anything like that. It's specifically the size. I'm going to take you straight to the mark scheme here because it's quite a, quite a weird one. So here we go. So the word that you have to have is maintains, okay? So the small lumen maintains the pressure. Um, yeah, it doesn't create the pressure. That's not allowed because the heart is what creates the blood pressure. Um, I think I did accept keeps the pressure because keeps and maintains are basically the same word. But I'm not even sure if you should really get that mark. So you have to say maintains. So let's first of all look at the artery. So the arteries maintains the pressure. And then, um, then the second sort of part I'll do in green here is veins. Why is, what's, what's the point of their larger lumen? So large lumen in the veins gives low resistance or low friction. Okay, low resistance or low friction, which means that um, it eases the flow. Uh, so there's less resistance, okay, less resistance to flow because there's low friction. Um, and basically because there is a lower pressure in the veins, um, the blood is moving at a slower rate through the vein, but over a wider area. If you do geography, this will make sense to you because you know about kind of um, the, the river flow. So your rivers can flow slowly, but with a wider base. Um, and that would be the same, I think, the rate of discharge as a fast flowing but narrow river. Okay, similar sort of idea, arteries versus veins. Okay, on to the next one. Here, this one, um, you've just had to spot some things. The wall of blood vessels contains a polymer called collagen. Now, collagen, you need to know. Collagen is one of the, uh, it's a fibrous protein. Okay, you need to know the structure of collagen, just like you need to know the structure of hemoglobin, which is the globular protein example that you need to know. So it's a fibrous protein. So name the type of monomer from which collagen is made. It's a protein, therefore it's made from amino acids. And it's joined together by, so let's say that's, you know, that's one mark. It's joined together, but you need to get two marks here. So it's joined together by a condensation reaction. And that forms a peptide bond. Now, at least one of you said a polypeptide bond. That is not correct. 
It is a peptide bond. I think I was very generous when I gave it, but it is a peptide bond, not a polypeptide bond. The polypeptide is the polymer, and the peptide bond is what links the monomers together. Okay, on we go. 22. Biological processes can be investigated using models. The effect of cell size and diffusion can be investigated using cubes of agar jelly to represent cells of different sizes. Uh, okay, so this is the kind of the experiment where you have a sort of cube of agar jelly, and it kind of starts off purple, and eventually the acid goes, soaks in, turning it colourless, so then you kind of just have a tiny little blob of purple colour in the middle, and then it vanishes, okay? Uh, I'll throw in a picture of this experiment here, just so you can kind of see the general idea. Okay, now it's gone. All right, for the next bit, this is the graph question. It's a four mark graph question. So you're given uh, the data on the insert, and then you have to plot it on the graph. So actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the mark scheme first, and then I'm gonna show you an example of a four mark answer. So the mark scheme for the graph is, uh, is down here. Oops, I missed the question, didn't I? Oops, hang on a minute. This one. The role of the universal indicator is to show the acid, to detect acid. And actually also, you could have said, to measure the end point, to measure the end point of the reaction, or to detect the presence of acid or H+. Here's the uh, mark scheme for the graph, okay? So the first one, um, I labelled your answers with the different marks. So the first one is really the... Uh, axes. Did you get them the right way round? So surface area to volume ratio on the x-axis and then time on the y-axis. That's the first mark. The second one here, um, you had to have all these things done. And I labelled this sort of mark point, I labelled it the curve. Because basically you needed to have, well, 50% of the area, I think one or two of you didn't get this one, at least half of available area. You can't have your graph too small. Um, the linear scale on both axes. So that means your scale has to be a regular linear scale. So, for example, going up in tenths, 10, 20, 30, 40, etc. It couldn't be um, changing scale halfway through the axis, but I don't think anyone did that. Uh, and then a line of best fit. Now, the line of best fit actually is a curve. It is not a line. Okay, so line of best fit doesn't really explain it here. But what I'm looking for is a curve and not dot to dot. Okay, not join the dots. It has to be a smooth curve. Then we have to have the labels correct. So then this, this mark I call labels. So axes labeled with minutes, this is key, and surface for error to volume ratio. This is interesting. Do not allow a few units given for the x-axis because the x-axis should be surface area to volume ratio and that doesn't have a unit. Um, and then all points plotted correctly to uh, half a grid square. Okay, so it has to be pretty bang on, okay? If I'm honest, I didn't really, really, really look at if your plotting was correct. I just looked at it a bit, and if it was correct, I gave you the mark. So examiners would be more picky about that. Um, right, let's look at the exam exemplars. So here's an exam exemplar. First of all, let's look at the axes. Surface area to volume ratio, time, yeah, axes, good. Right, now let's look at the curve. Yep, that is a smooth curve, and it's not join the dots. What I mean by join the dots is I don't want a straight line from here, a straight line here, like joining up the points with a ruler. That's not right. So the curve is good. It's big enough, right? It takes up 50% available space. The labels, is that right? Yeah, because we've got minutes here and there's no unit here. So labels is good. And the plots, I don't know, it looks pretty good to me. So let's just call the plots good. Okay, so that's a four mark graph there. Um, hopefully you can spot, if you didn't get a mark, which mark did you not get and why? Okay, back to the paper. Describe the pattern shown by the graph. So this, you want to say something like, as the surface to air, as the surface area to volume ratio um, increases, the time taken for the reaction or for diffusion decreases. Something like that. You could say the opposite way round. So time taken for the diffusion increases as the surface area to volume decreases. This O R A means or the reverse argument. So you said you could say time taken for diffusion decreases as the surface area to volume ratio increases. Okay. Um, the next one, the answer, I'll just give you straight here, is 0 0.44. But you can also get it from your from your graph. So let's look at the, the exemplar again and see how this person got it. Um, so 
This cube turned red after 21.5 minutes. So how do we get that from here? So um, you can see it, in fact. They've helpfully marked it on. So 21.5 on this person's scale is right here. You can see that they've gone across. They've drawn a dotted line for me here, which makes it very helpful for me to mark. And then they've gone down, 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 down. Oops, I'm not following it correctly, but it goes right to there. So there is where it strikes um, the thing there, which is about 0 0.44, uh, which I think is what exactly what they said. So uh, they said, I think, 0 0.44. But it is allowed, allow an answer in the range of 0 0.4 to 0 0.48 depending on the graph. So I would have given that person the mark, whatever they said, basically, is because it followed their graph. Suggest how the original procedure could be modified in order to improve the accuracy of your answer to part three. Okay, this part here. How do we improve the accuracy of this? Well, to really explain, I have to show you the exemplar again. So to improve, if I just get rid of this blue line that I've made here, to improve this estimate, how would we do that? Well, we need to have a better understanding of the rate of the calibration curve here. So we would have to have, I'll add them in in blue, we'd have to have you know, more cubes measured within this range to really get the curve perfect in that area. So that's what you needed to say. It was not just do more cubes. That's not good enough. You have to say do more cubes in a certain range. So do more cubes with a surface area of between, this one was 0 0.3 and this one was 0 0.6. So you need to say something along those lines. More surface area, cu more cubes with a surface area of between 0 0.3 and 0 0.6 tested. Okay, you could have also said um, between 10 and 20 millimeters, because if you look on the insert, um, that's the, the size of the cube lengths that you need to test with it. Okay, so you have to say that, not just more cubes, but what size cubes. Okay, so question C. Use the data here on the insert, sorry, to calculate the rate of diffusion of cube C. So let's go to the insert. So cube C is here, and length of one side is 20 millimeters. Okay, so we're talking about a cube that is 20 millimeters in side length. Now, we need the rate of diffusion into the center of the cube. So if the side length is 20, the distance to the center of the cube is 10 millimeters. That was the first key thing you needed to uh, see. So when working out, so we have 10 millimeters. And how quick is it? Uh, go back to the insert. Um, it takes 28.8 minutes um, for it to diffuse, sorry, to, to, for it to turn fully red. So therefore, um, and we want the rate, so it's going to be millimeters per minute. So we're going to divide by minutes. So we want 28, I've forgotten what it said already. What was it? 28.8. 28.8. And if you do that correctly, you're going to get this number 0 0.35 or 0 0.347. So um, it did, you could get one mark, by the way, if you had forgotten to, uh, to sort of divide by two, if you worked with 20 millimeters instead of 10. So you could have got one mark for that. So 0 0.69 or 6.94. Um, okay. Oh, aha, sorry, almost missed out a bit. This is, so this is two marks for the number. Look at that, two marks for the number. But the third mark is for the unit. So if you're thinking, why did I not get three marks? It's this, all right, millimeters per minute, minute minus one, or you could have had millimeters per minute like this, mm slash min, or mm min to the minus one. Mark, uh, units are essential there. Explain which of the mean values, A to E, is likely to be the least accurate. You should process data from the table to support your answer. Okay, well, the one that's gonna be the least accurate is gonna be this one, okay, A. Now that's because it is a small cube and any tiny differences in the cutting of that small cube will have a proportionately larger effect. So that's part of it. What about this processed data stuff? Well, you probably, the best, I would say the best easiest thing to do here is to calculate the range in amongst the tests. So from the biggest to the smallest, so that's 6.4 minus 2.9, so you can calculate the range, and the range there is going to be a big range compared to, uh, to compare to the others. Okay, so let's look at the mark scheme. 
So cube A, because um, time for test two uh, is different from the others, and the use of process figures to support, so that will be the range. And then, sorry, I think I've muddled my, slightly muddled my answers to D part one and part two. This is really where you need to talk about the, the limits um, in the cutting. So the limitation is that there may be inaccuracies in the surface area because it were, the, the cubes were cut sort of uh, manually or by hand, so there may be small inaccuracies in the surface area of the cubes, and that's more likely to affect cube A because any tiny differences will have a larger proportional effect. So here's the mark scheme. So there was another thing you could have said. First, let's look at that first one, which I just mentioned. I'll highlight that in yellow. So inconsistency in surface area, cube A, uh, and that is because. Um, the inconsistencies will have a proportionately larger effect on a small cube. Another thing you could have said, and some of you did in fact, is it's difficult to judge the end point. So using the human eye and judgment to determine the end point, so i.e. when the, the cube has changed colour, and that's going to be more difficult with QB because basically you have to peer through the jelly. And you're looking through two centimetres of jelly, so it's difficult to see that tiny little bit in the middle. Uh, so harder to see through two centimetres of jelly or something like that. Um, on to this one. Uh, e, tough one here. Um, many people went wrong because they didn't quite spot something here, okay? So the, the procedure described above involved these model cells, blah, blah, blah. The rate of movement of molecules from, this is the key bit, from the plasma membrane towards the center of living cells. Okay, so we're not talking about movement across the plasma membrane. It's once you get into the plasma membrane or underneath it, from there to the inside of the cell. So why would the rate of movement be greater in a living cell than in this model jelly cube? Well, really, it's to do with the cytoskeleton and vesicles uh, and movement whoops, within the cytoplasm. So you remember I showed you that little video uh, where you have that kind of, oops, well, let's call that, let's call that the cytoskeleton thing. And then you've got this little like weird kind of walkie protein. It's called the dynein protein. It's kind of tailored to a big old vesicle. So these are transport proteins involved with the cytoskeleton. So that's what you need to talk about. There are transport proteins which are involved with the cytoskeleton to enable things to move about inside the cell. And on the mark scheme, that's what it says. Idea of the involvement of the cytoskeleton and or vesicles, transport vesicles. Okay, so on to question 23. So this one's all about uh, transport in plants. So here we have a picture of some xylem, uh, and we have uh, on this area here, it shows the pit in the xylem. What is the function of the pit in the xylem tissue? You have to say a very key word here. You have to say lateral, Lateral movement of water. Why do you have to say lateral? You can say, I think sideways, I think would have been allowed. Let's be blue for the water. Because water can move up the xylem, uh, sort of straight up here, without the pits, because the xylem themselves are hollow. So movement of water through the xylem is not acceptable. It's the pits are for when the water has to exit the xylem and come out sideways. Okay, so we're looking for the lateral movement of water. The mark scheme says lateral movement of water, that's what it says, but I think I also accepted sideways, or I think I may have also accepted for water to leave the xylem, but maybe that was a bit too generous. Certainly not just movement of water, it has to be lateral. Um, okay, now this one was done quite poorly. Um, maybe it's something we didn't really spend enough time in when we did the syllabus. Um, it's about differentiation. Uh, how does the xylem cell end up like it is? So the type of cell present in meristematic tissue is a stem cell. Now I wonder if you would be allowed to say cambium. No. Maybe in another mark scheme you might also have cambium, but I think stem cell is, is better because cambium is where the stem cells in vascular tissue arise, but stem cells are the best. So anyway, how does the xylem get to be like it is? Well, let's try and draw you a little diagram, a little quick one. 
Okay, so first of all, we have a cell. Okay, normal cell, plant cell, so on, it's alive. It has all the stuff that normal plant cells have. This cell then undergoes a process of elongation. It stretches out like that. Okay, still a normal cell. Still got its all sorts of great stuff. Then the cell uh, starts to get thicker cell walls. And in fact, the end cell walls start to break down. So the, this, I'm going to add some red in here. This is lignin being deposited in the cell walls of this cell. Still, the cell is clinging on to life. It's got its vacuole and stuff. But the end ends are kind of starting to be break down. And then finally, basically, the cell dies. It goes through a process of apoptosis so that all the stuff in the middle kind of uh, empties out. And then we've just basically got pretty much left with a tube of lignin, essentially. So what are the steps? We're looking for elongation. We're looking for lignin being deposited. There is a word for that. We can say lignification. Lignification. And then we can call, we can say that the, the end walls break down. Um, sort of emptying of cell contents. And maybe even apoptosis, although I don't think there was a mark for that. Apoptosis of the cell. So here's the mark scheme. Stem cells. Differentiation. I didn't use that word. I could have used that word. So the cell is differentiating. It's becoming its final differentiated sort of type of cell. Elongation, lignification, and end walls break down. I forgot to say differentiation there. Differentiation, elongation, lignification, cell walls breaking down. Okay, xylem form part of a plant's transport system. Why do large multicellular plants not need a transport system? Well, we've got a few things. First of all, their surface area to volume ratio is not sufficiently large. Second of all, the distance from the outside of the plant to the center of the plant is too large for diffusion to, to carry things. And thirdly, we need to transport materials, for example, water from the roots to the leaves, which is a long way, or sugar from the leaves to the roots, which is a long way to supply the cell with something to respire. So the mark scheme covers all these things. Um, so idea of long distance from external surface to cells. I'm going to zoom in on this a little. Idea of long distance from external surface to cells. Um, small surface area to volume ratio. Diffusion not fast enough. Notice that is uh, underlined. So you can't just say it's not fast enough without a transport system, you actually have to use the word diffusion, because if you didn't have a transport system, that is what would be occurring, just diffusion to move things. And then naming a substance, so uh, here they've named sucrose, also water is another thing that you could have named a substance that is transported. Okay, this one. Uh, this one was somewhat poorly done by some people, some people did it really well, but other people not so much. You have to recognize this type of Plant, okay, this is a plant. It's got a, the stem has air in it. Okay, most plants do not have air spaces in the stem. This is quite unusual. So um, this shows you that it is a hydrophyte. Hydrophyte. Okay, hydrophyte air spaces in the stem. So what other adaptations are likely in hydrophyte leaves? Well, we've got the stomata on the upper surface. Because if the stomata are on the lower surface, then they can't get any air. I think I drew a picture like this before. So this is my my mum's pond. She's got a pond. She's got water lilies in it. The water lily leaves sit like this. They float on the surface of the water, and the stem goes down like this to the roots, which is in a pot. Now, the stomata have to be up here to allow air to get into the air space. If the stomata were on the underside like normal, they wouldn't be um, sort of in contact with the air. Also, we're probably likely to have air spaces in the leaves as well. Uh, what was the other one? I can't remember now. Uh, so large surface area, many stomata to increase max, uh, maximize gas exchange, and the fact that the stomata on the top surface. Okay, so many stomata, stomata on the top surface, large surface area. Ah, yes, thin waxy cuticle. The waxy cuticle is, is about protecting the leaf from water loss. So it doesn't need to be very thick. It's a thin waxy cuticle. So um, because the plant doesn't need to produce all that and that wax, it's a waste of resources. OK. OK, so now we're on to uh, question 24. 
all about chromatography. Uh, so that's the second part of the insert down here. So that's about this uh, chromatogram. Um, so let's go to the paper. So the first one, name the organelle that's likely to have yielded all the pigments present in the leaf. So things like chlorophyll you should recognize come from the chloroplast. Now we will do some more work on uh, the chloroplast and photosynthesis um, next year. So this question is almost sort of previewing some stuff uh, from year 13. However, uh, it's really just the chroma chromatography stuff that you really need to know for this. So it is still year, year 12 syllabus. The second part um, suggests why it was important that the leaf extract was dried thoroughly. You just want to get across the idea that some water in the pigment may have affected the RF value. So that's the idea. Let's just go to look at the MART scheme. So the MART scheme, yeah, idea that presence of water may have affected or altered the RF. And you can also allow that the, the pigments might have been too diluted um, for, for the process. Calculate the RF value, value for pigment Y on figure 24.1. Now, um, again, I can't do measuring on my computer or I haven't figured it out yet, but this is how you would do it. So pigment Y. So the original position of the sample, here is pigment Y, here is the solvent front. Now, I actually think that this probably, um, the value you got is probably determined by where you measured it. So if we look at these bands, um, so first of all, the way that this is done is someone basically takes a paintbrush and brushes the pigments along the sample. So you get a full line of pigment along this uh, start line. And then as the solvent runs up, it carries a kind of uh, a whole line of pigment as opposed to a dot. So where are you supposed to do this um, to? So I would go, I would measure the distance to the solvent front. You know, this is supposed to be a straight 90 degrees line. So that's the sort of solvent front. Let's call that the S for the solvent front. And then um, the distance to the pigment Y, I would measure right to the center there. Okay, so I think if you measured on the edge, that probably would not have given you the right result. So let's call that just the pigment. So then the RF is equal to the distance moved by the pigment, which I've labeled P here, divided by the distance moved by the solvent front, which I've labeled S there. And you had to get an answer of 0 0.61. You could have also got 0 0.60 between that to 0 0.62. Does that, I notice it says do not allow 0 0.6 because that's to one significant figure. And you may notice that in the question, all the other RF values are given to two significant figures or two decimal places. So you must keep consistency. Always remember, if you're calculating a value, yeah, you need to keep consistency. Okay, the student concluded that pigment Y was probably chlorophyll A. How well do the results support that conclusion? So, uh, chlorophyll A, that is this one. Let's label it blue green. Uh, okay, so we calculated a value of 0. Point, you know, you may have carried calculated a value of something like 0. 0.61. So what do we what can we say? Well, number one, 0. 0.61 is not exactly 0. 0.63. So that's a that's a bit of a, a negative. A positive is it's pretty close. Um, and the other thing is that the colour on this chart is listed as blue green, and on the insert, which is in colour, it's bluey. So yeah, it's close. Blue is close to blue green. So those are the things you could have said. Um, so does not support. So a negative mark. Sorry, a negative thing says it's not 0 0.63. However, it's close, close enough. Um, the other RF values also appear to be slightly lower. Uh, if you, you could, that means you could have actually calculated the other RF values and worked out that they're all a bit low. Correct ranking. That's important, and the color is blue green. So what do I mean by correct ranking? So, uh, well, look, we've got carotene, pheophytin, chlorophyll A. Look, these are in, in sort of number order. So this is going to move the furthest, second furthest, third furthest on the chromatogram. Carotene, pheophytin, chlorophyll A. And if we look here, that would mean this is carotene, this is pheophytin, and this is chlorophyll A. So that, again, fits, uh, supports that statement. Okay. Moving on to the, I think the last question, 25. 
Okay, calculate the rate. So this is antibody production, antibody concentration. So we want the rate of anti production at day 10. Now this is key, this phrase here, at day 10. So not up until day 10, but at day 10. So we need to draw a tangent here. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so I can try and draw that better for you guys. Again, I don't have a ruler here. So if we're looking at day 10, this point here, we need to draw a tangent. And actually that should be quite easy because this line looks to be pretty straight. So I'm just going to do that in green. So the tangent line is going to be like that you should be doing this with a ruler and then you can sort of work out so you can work out let's say this distance here so that is from I would say 7 to 25 so this x the sort of the change in x here 7 to 25 is what's that that's 3 plus 10 so that's 18 Uh, and then this distance up here is that's going to be about I'd say maybe 32 there so from my sort of uh, estimated tangent we would do the change in y divided by the change in x to work out the gradient of the tangent so it would be 32 divided by 18 uh, which gives me let's get my calculator out I don't know if, let's see if I get this right 32 divided by 18, I get 1.77. 7. 7, but I round that to 1.78, and that would be in uh, octreenos per day. Did I get it right? Nope. Should be 1.5, uh, because I did not use the ruler. So use the ruler. Um, 7 to 25, yeah, and then that's 20, 30, yeah. Yeah, anyway, use ruler. Okay, last two questions. B, explain why the response to the subsequent infection is much bigger than response to vaccination. Uh, so we need to talk about uh, the difference between primary and secondary response. Let me just get rid of this again. And let's sort of color those in. So first of all, primary response is kind of, you know, the this area. This is all primary response. Now the primary response, first of all, it, after the vaccination, it takes a while to get going, and that's because um, we have various things that are occurring. So we are having things like clonal selection of naive B cells and T cells. We have a select, well, also antigen presentation. I don't think that's on the mark scheme, but we have that. So first of all, we have antigen presentation, clonal selection and clonal expansion to select the right lymphocytes that can respond to the antigens presented in the vaccine. That all takes time. However, when we get to the secondary response here, or this area, this is much, much bigger and uh, faster. And that is because primarily there are memory cells present already. And in fact, we, we could also, if we want to go deeper, we could say B memory cells, T memory cells as well, uh, which means they can undergo uh, proliferation is faster because the memory cells are already circulating in the bloodstream, ready to divide. Mark scheme. So the vaccination, that's that first bit, the first primary response. Vaccination involves clonal selection and antigen presentation and clonal expansion or proliferation. Didn't use this word, I could use that word, differentiation. What that's referring to is that basically a naive I don't think we really use this terminology too much at A level, but a naive B cell, that's a B cell that has never met an antigen that it can respond to, has to be stimulated, activated, and then remember B cells differentiate into plasma cells that are all the ones that actually make the antibodies. Um, whereas in the secondary response, memory cells already present in response to infection. Now, lots of people talked about memory cells, but they didn't sort of say the things that made it slower in the vaccination uh, first bit. 
final question. Antibodies have a number of mechanisms of action. For example, agglutinins cause pathogens to be rendered inactive by clumping them together. Okay, outline the action of opsonins. Well, an opsonin, just to draw a quick diagram, let's say there's a bacteria, let's say, uh, and an opsonin is an antibody that can, well, obviously attach to the bacteria, but also it can attach to a receptor on a white blood cell, which I'm going to draw here. So here is a white blood cell that is now sort of uh, attached to a receptor on its surface. And it means that it's going to eat the whole thing. Okay, so there's little receptors on the white blood cells surface like this that attach to the back end of the antibody, so that the white blood cell is going to engulf that whole thing. Let's make it a neutrophil with a lobe nucleus, and it's going to eat this thing and digest it. So in terms of the Mark scheme, what we need increased likelihood of phag phagocytosis, and we need this idea that it binds to both the pathogen and the phagocyte or the macrophage. So you may have said, some of you said, that it binds to the pathogen, but you need to get this idea of sort of binding to the pathogen at one side, with the variable region, and the constant region at the other part of the antibody binds to the macrophage, okay? All right, so that is um, this video done. We have fully looked at that paper, um, I'm sending you also the mark scheme with this so you can see the mark scheme for yourself. And remember, uh, this is part of your summer homework um, to have this paper uh, fully corrected before the first lesson back. Uh, don't forget also you should be reading uh, some book uh, and please message me what you're reading. All right, I'll uh, release the other video later on this week uh, and I hope you're having a good holiday. Bye bye.